Hello, and welcome to another episode of At Home with APS. I'm Mrs. K, and today I'm going to be joined by Miss Mays, Miss Kraff, and Miss Lori. And we have a really exciting day for you today. Now, you might have noticed I look a little bit differently today because today on our show, it is crazy hat day. Now, my hat's not particularly crazy, but you can't spell crazy without the letter C. Exactly. So this is my crazy hat. If you don't have a crazy hat on, hurry real quick, go run and put one on so that we can all be wearing one together. Now, Last week, we started a really exciting new unit where we were addressing this essential question. How do the goods we make, buy, and sell connect us? Today, we're going to keep talking about that idea of buying and selling goods. And for our word of the day, oh, I'm so excited to share it with you. Because this word of the day has two meanings. This is the first word we're going to do together where we're really going to look at both meanings for this word. And so this word relates to our essential question, but it also has another meaning that doesn't connect as well. But I know that you're up for the challenge, so you're going to do two tasks with me today. Two tasks for two different meanings for our word. Are you ready? Let's get to it. This word is appreciate. <gasps> appreciate. Say appreciate three times in your whisper voice. Appreciate. 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 <laughs> now, what I want you to do, because I'm sure most of you have heard this word before, can you tell me in your own words, what do you think the word appreciate means? Yeah, so sometimes when we think of the word appreciate, we think of feeling grateful for someone or thankful for someone. And that's the first definition that we're going to look at. To understand the value of, or importance of something. So when we understand how valuable or important something or someone is, we appreciate them. And we can show that we appreciate them by telling them that we appreciate them and by telling them thank you or telling them that we are grateful for them. So with this first definition, I'm gonna give you a challenge. I'm gonna ask you to try to write two notes or two cards or two letters that tell someone that you appreciate them. Now it can be a family member Maybe a grown-up in your home, or maybe a sibling. Maybe it can be the teacher that you see through your computer or on the phone. Or maybe it can be a neighbor or someone else that you care about. It doesn't have to be somebody that lives with you. It can also be someone that lives far away, and you can mail this in the mail. I wrote two cards to two teachers that tell them I appreciate them. This first one is to Miss Solon. She is a fourth and fifth grade teacher at Los Ranchos Elementary School. I said, Ms. Solon, I appreciate you. Thank you for being such a hardworking and kind teacher. Love, Mrs. K. The second note of appreciation I wrote is to Ms. Jaramillo. Ms. Jaramillo is a second grade teacher at Navajo Elementary School. I said, Ms. Jaramillo, thank you for all your hard work in and out of the classroom. I appreciate your knowledge and work ethic. Love, Mrs. K. Sometimes if I'm feeling a little down, if I take a minute to tell somebody else that I appreciate them or I care about them, it makes me feel a little bit better. So I'm gonna challenge you to write these two notes. Oops, I hold up four fingers. Two notes <laughs> to two different people telling them you appreciate them or you understand the value or importance of them. Are you ready for our next definition to the word appreciate? This might be new to you. The second definition is to increase 
in value. Hmm. We're going to connect this back to buying and selling goods. Now, this is kind of a hard concept, but I know that you are smart and hardworking. Hang in there with me. You'll get it. So when we say that something appreciates in value, it means the value goes up or maybe it costs more. Hmm. For example, a lot of really old artwork appreciates in value over time. So when the artist first made it, it was worth a certain amount of money. And then after a long period of time, maybe after this artist became more famous, those pieces of art appreciate in value. So if you were to buy them, they would be more expensive. Hmm, can you think of something else that might appreciate in value over time or become worth more? When I was your age, I used to collect baseball cards. Some baseball cards appreciate in value. That means when I bought them, they didn't cost that much. But then as that baseball player became more famous, maybe went on to win certain championships, that card became more valuable. It appreciated in value. Maybe also, if you got the autograph of somebody that you see perform at the state fair, maybe a song that you hear live, and then that artist, that singer, that musician becomes more famous and their songs start playing on the radio, maybe that autograph you got will appreciate in value or become more expensive to increase in value. So remember I said you had two projects. Your first assignment was to write two cards showing appreciation for someone using our first definition, where we tell them that we're thankful or grateful for them. Our next step is to use this new definition in our Freyer model. Remember this new definition, you can read it with me, is to increase in value. Hmm. Let's keep that in our brain and go over to our Freyer model together. Now, as you can see, I got pretty excited to share this word with you, so I already put my word in the middle of the box. Go ahead and write the word appreciate in the middle. The next thing we're gonna do is put our definition. Now, you can put both definitions of this word, but I really want us to focus right now on the second one, which was to increase in value. So that's what I'm gonna write here. I'm gonna write it while you write it. Okay. Now, let's go down to the synonyms. Can you think of a synonym for the word appreciate? And remember, we're using this definition right now. Can you think of a synonym that would fit? Hmm. So when I was planning for this, I had a really hard time thinking of a synonym for the word appreciate. So I did some research on my computer. One of the words that they came up with, or that the thesaurus said, was this word, to increase. I don't usually like to use a word from the definition as a synonym, but I don't know that I can really think of another one. Maybe you can challenge yourself to go look in a thesaurus and see if you can come up with another synonym that I don't have up here for this definition of appreciate. Let's go on to this next part. What do we put here? Our creative sentence, exactly. Now remember, we're using this definition to increase in value. Can you make up a creative sentence that uses the word appreciate, where the word appreciate means to increase in value? 
Go ahead and say it into your TV. Very good. I'm going to share my creative sentence with you right now. Are you ready? I'm going to go back to that connection I made to my baseball cards when I was little. My creative sentence is, my Babe Ruth baseball card appreciated in value over time because it became more expensive. I'm going to write my creative sentence in the box while you write yours. Now, I don't really have a Babe Ruth baseball card. That would be pretty cool. But I can pretend, because this is my own creative sentence. Here in this last box, do you remember what goes there? Exactly, you're gonna draw an illustration of your creative sentence. So maybe in mine, I might draw a picture of the baseball card when I first got it, and then later, after it appreciated in value. Now, before we leave, I just want to remind you of our tasks. Step one, we're going to use our first definition of this word to write two notes to people letting them know that you appreciate them. Your second task is to finish filling in your Freyer model with that other definition of the word appreciate. I appreciate you and how hard you work today. Good morning, readers. This is Miss Mays coming um, up with some word work and a crazy hat because it's crazy hat day. This was made for me on my birthday for my good friend Nancy. It's a bike helmet, but it has all kinds of fun things. A bell, has a light, a crown. So yes, I hope that you have a crazy hat that you can wear um, some days just to be fun and silly. And so we're gonna start with a good morning stretch and make our left brain talk to our right brain. You know how I love to do that. Some kid focus brain wake ups. So go ahead and stand up and put your stuff down and get some room around you at your house. Put your feet shoulder width apart and we're gonna do our stretch just because I love the stretch. We're gonna stretch up to the ceiling. Uh, Try to touch the ceiling. Can you go a little bit higher? Ah, okay, now go down and just let your spine kind of stretch. If you can touch the ground, more power to you. Ah, okay, then we're gonna come up and stop at midway, and we're gonna go to our right and taking some breaths. <sighs> Stretching, getting ready to do some phonics, work with some open and closed syllables. Do you remember those from your class? Okay, we're gonna do another one. Yeah, so start thinking about open and closed syllable words. And then multi-syllable words where you have them together. Okay, let's stretch up one more time. Okay, now we're gonna stop in the middle. And remember, we're gonna do our lazy eight and do some cross lateral movement to get our left brain talking to our right brain. So we're gonna make a lazy eight with our whole body. Take some deep breaths in. Oh, I have to remember to go slow. Okay, we'll do one more. Okay. There we go. Okay. Shake it out. And now we're going to do push up the sky. <clears throat> I don't know if you saw me and Miss Growth do a math and science lesson, but I'll teach you how to do it this time. We're going to clap our hands together 
Get some energy. Do you feel that heat? It's energy. Now, like, pull it apart. Kind of like taffy. Can you feel it? If you can't feel the energy, do it this some more until you feel that energy. Yes. And then we're going to take our right hand and push up the sky and our left hand push down the earth. And then we'll switch. Watch. We're going to go. This is getting us nice and grounded, ready to do some learning. The breathing's getting some oxygen to our brain. We'll do two more. Okay, now take that energy, put it inside, ready to learn, shake it out, and get ready to practice some open and closed syllables, words. So you could have a piece of paper, a notebook, pencil, or crayon, or something, just anything to write with, because that doesn't matter. But let's review what a closed syllable word is. A closed syllable word is a, it has one vowel, and it's followed by at least one consonant. And like, here's a really simple one, like this. Cat. Cat has one vowel, and it's followed by a consonant. And the cat, the A, the A, ah, can't get out. So it's a short vowel. It's a closed vowel, right? Now there are some exceptions to this rule. I know you guys are saying, oh, my teacher taught me that there's exceptions. You're right, there's five exceptions. There's old, O-L-D, ILD, I-L-D, IND, I-N-D, like as in find, OLT, O-L-T, and O-S-T, as in post, because those are followed by consonants, but they are long vowels. So those are the exceptions. But a lot of times, most of the times, it's closed, it's, yeah, they're closed syllables. So let's try some of those words. Let's try, um, how about plant? Plant. Let's tap that out. P -u -a -n -t. Plant. So let's see if that's a closed syllable. It is. P -u -a -n -t. Plant. See how the vowel is followed by at least one consonant, but there's actually two, right? So it says ah, so that's a closed syllable. Okay, let's try another one. What about the word munch? Mm. Let's munch on some chips. Munch. Let's tap that one out. Mmm, uh, mmm. Munch. Let's try that. See, one vowel, the vowel is U, followed by some consonants. So it's a closed vowel. Munch. Okay, now this time I'm going to write it and then we're going to see if the closed vowel rule will help us read it. So let's sound it out. If we come to this word when we're reading, so I mm, slide. Mm -hmm. But there's no this. There, it's a closed vowel. It's a closed syllable, right? So we're going to remember that this is a short vowel. I, so im, slim. And then you read the other words that are around it to see if it makes sense. Right. So that way you can figure out an unknown word using the closed syllable rule. Let's try one more. What about crib? Crib. K -k. Oh, this is a little tricky, isn't it? What letters say K? C and K and CK. So we're not gonna write that right now. Let's go to the next sound. R -r. E B. It is closed. So do you guys remember the C and K rule? K before E, I, or Y. Is that an E? No. 
Is that an I? No. Is that a Y? No. So it's not a K, it is a C. And CK goes at the end of the words, of short vowel words, right? So these are closed syllable words. But we also have open syllable words. An open syllable word makes, there's no consonant next to it following the vowel. So it says its name. Here's one, this one, let's see. Oh, I'm gonna take this down so we can use, so we can use this. Here we go. Open syllables, let's do open. So let's try an easy one, like the word hi. Hi. Ha. I. Do you see that? We know that there's no consonant following it, so the I says I, right? So this is an open syllable. Okay, so, but there's lots of other words like, how about we? These are all very simple, right? But it does give us a hint. There's no consonant, so we know it's a long w e. What if we do the word, like we put, we have a word that has, it's a multi-syllable word. It has an open and a closed or two closed. How about this one? Let's try. Because the, the open syllable we got, right? Hi, we, there's even the word he, ha, e. But if we have multi-syllable words, how about if we come to this word? We're reading. I want to order off the, hmm, don't know what this word is. How could we figure this out? Let's try it. Well, m, e, n, u, me, in. That doesn't make sense, does it? So you're gonna, you always want it to make sense. But if we look for the short, Vowel, oh, this is followed by a consonant. So this is gonna be short, men, and this is open, men, you. So it's multi-syllables. It has a closed and an open. And this is how, I, it helps me remember. Men, you. Multi-syllable words can be big words, but if we break them down into smaller chunks, we can read them or spell them. How about tulip? Have you seen the tulips um, blooming around town? Tulip. T -u -l -i -p. Tulip. Let's see. T -u -l -i -p. I'm going to put the U, but I, that U doesn't. Tulip. Hmm? But if you tulip, the U isn't open because we're basically chopping this word into two syllables. Chew, this is open, so the U says its name. Eh, eh, because it has a consonant. This is closed. And this works with really big words, like monster. Monster. If you're reading a story and you come to this word, you're like, I don't know what it says. You can break it up into syllables. Monster. This is ah, ah. It's followed by a consonant. So it's closed. Stir. This is also closed. So there's, when you come to big words, look for the different syllables. Or if you're trying to spell big words like lobster, let's say you're writing a story about a lobster, you can clap that out and figure out how many syllables are in it. Lob. Stir. So let's do this. Lob is the first syllable. Lob. Stir. Stir. Lob. Stir. Do you see how that the, breaking it up into syllables? This is a closed syllable. So is this. Lobster is helping you spell and read. So keep that in mind when you're reading stories. Use all the strategies that your teachers taught you. Make sure it makes sense. Use the words around it. 
and break the word up into smaller syllables or smaller words. Um, so thank you for joining me today for some open and closed syllable review. I hope everyone, when you're riding your bike, you wear your helmet. You could decorate it, see, it could be fabulous like this one. But next up, we we're going to have um, some more writing and reading. And thank you for joining me on a at APS, at home with APS, that is, sorry. Hi, hi learners. It's Mrs. Kraft, and today I'm going to work with you on some writing. So before um, you worked with Miss Lori on a very long research project, but now we're getting towards the end of the year, and this is something I like to do with my students because it's fun, so don't groan, um, and it's very creative. So as you can see from my board, we're going to work on poetry. But also, it's a very precise form of poetry that's going to be short. So it's called a haiku. And today, since we have hat day, you can see that I am wearing my haiku hat because that's going to help me think about the haikus that I'm going to create. All right. So haiku is a form of poetry that was invented in Japan. Do you remember where Japan is? What continent is it on? If you said Asia, you're absolutely right. So it's pretty far away from us. But in Japan, they created a form of poetry called the haiku. And the haiku is very short. It's only three lines. Yeah, three lines. So you can do this. Maybe you've done one before in class. It has also three short lines. Let me explain to you. So our first line in our haiku is only going to have five syllables. The second line is only going to have seven syllables. And then the third line goes back to five. So you just worked with Miss Mays on syllables, on open and closed syllables, and you can see that when we clap them out, that's not very many words, is it? Right. So I'm going to share with you some examples and then see if you can create some on your own. And what haiku really, the original writers of haiku did it with nature. So it should evoke, because think about, if you only have five syllables, you have to be, you have to use a short word, don't you? Or a few short words. So we have to think about something that creates a vivid image. And by vivid, we mean it paints a picture. So go back to our, our remember our work on adjectives and adverbs? Yeah, and so we use those adjectives to describe the nouns, to make them more precise and more, more of an image that you could see in your mind. So that's what we're going to do when we write a haiku, is create images. And when haikus started, they were often about nature or things that were naturally occurring. And that works really well with our unit from last week. So we worked on science. We talked about rocks, we talked about rock collecting. Miss Kathy talked to you about plants and germination. So we had all kinds of things that we worked on that we could write haikus about. And we also, this week, are talking about economics. So we can think about things that are going on in our life and write a haiku about that. All right, so let me walk you through this a little bit and we'll see if we can get a haiku written here. As I said, you want to use your senses, sight, touch, smell, and hearing. When you write your haiku, when you think of words to put in it, and you want to use that vivid images. Vivid means something you're able to see. If somebody's making popcorn, 
Can you smell it? You can, right? Because it infects our sense of smell and it's easy to pick up on. And we're thinking, oh, we want some. So that evokes that vivid sense when, you, when somebody does that. Or how about baking cookies? Can you imagine and remember what that smells like? Mm. I want to share a haiku, a very famous haiku with you. It's by a Japanese poet, and, his name, and her name is Matsuo Basho. And this is one of the most famous haikus ever written. And it was written way back in the 1600s, long time ago. And it's called The Old Pond. So here's an example of what a haiku looks like. An old silent pond. A frog jumps into the pond. Splash. Silent again. That's the entire poem. But can you picture something from this? Does it affect your senses? Can you see that frog jumping into the pond? And splash. So this poet chose these words very carefully. Let's go through it and clap them out and see if it's based on that 575 five that we talked about. Can you clap these with me? An old silent pond. An old silent pond. Five. A frog jumps into the pond. A frog jumps into the pond. We have seven. Splash. Sigh. Lent again. All right, so we've got five, seven, five. If you have something to take notes on, it might be a good time to write that down. Haiku, line one, five syllables. Line two, seven syllables. And line three, five syllables. So you can see, even if you don't like poetry, or you don't think you can write it, most of us can come up with five syllables, right? Yeah, you can do this. OK. I want to share with you a couple of haiku that I wrote. And we'll see what you think. My first one is titled Change. So you can give your haiku a title, and that helps set the scene for it, right? So mine is called Change. And look at this first word, metamorphosis. Wow, remember we clapped that out when we learned that word and when Miss Anna made it our word of the day. Let's clap that out. Metamorphosis. We underline that for us. Met or divide it. Met a more fo sis. One, two, three, four, five. Oh my goodness. That word makes up the entire first line of my poem. All right. Metamorphosis. Heat. Pressure. Create beauty. Rock transformation. And you can see that I've used some um, endings. I used an exclamation point here, and I used a period here. That helps create interest in your poem. So be sure you're using that. It could be a question mark. It could be an exclamation point. Whatever it is that makes the reader remember, know what you're trying to say. All right, so that is my haiku on science. I also wrote one kind of about the time that we're going through right now. So I titled it C-19. And here's my haiku. Headed to the store. My mask and gloves feel strange. The goods we need. 
So to me, that's not quite that nature image, right? But it's a thought about what's going on right now, what we're experiencing. So now, this is a cool time to write haiku because we have time, right? You don't have to get up and go to school every day. You have time to take a walk. So you can go to the park. Maybe you can just sit outside your house and watch the cars go by. And you can see and feel and hear and take time to listen like we haven't always done. So what I'd love to have you do is when you think about writing your haiku, sit outside and take some notes. What do you like? Is there a beautiful flower that you see? The color just grabs you. Could you write about that? Think about that. So make some notes about some subjects that you could use. And then when you choose your subject, write some words that grab you about that. And you've almost written your haiku then. So you can do this. I'd love to have you write a haiku and then submit it to our APS at Home Twitter page or website if you allow us to use it. And that way we can show others that you've done this work. So, so haiku, take some notes, make a list, and create a beautiful poem. And don't forget to send it into APS because we love to see your work. Thank you, guys. Hi, readers and friends. Welcome back to our second, third grade hour of At Home with APS. I'm Miss Lori, and we are going to continue our discussion that we started last week around money and how it helps us and how we earn it, spend it, and save it. So before we get started with today's um, reading, I want to go back and review a little bit of last week, what we talked about. So we were talking about informational texts, and this is, this is a book, What Can You Do With Money?, Earning, Spending, and Saving by Jennifer Larson, and it is published by um, Learner Publications, Minneapolis. And it is a nonfiction informational textbook. And I'm curious to know out there how many of you remember some of the things that come with an informational text. What are some of the structures that are built in to help us navigate and find information when we are using informational text. So I'm gonna give you a second to think about what we talked about last Wednesday around the text structures that are built into informational text. Okay, so let's look. Who remembers that one of the first things at the beginning is always a table of contents? And in the table of contents is listed all of the different information that is available in that book. So if you are trying to find out some information or doing some research around goods and services, then I don't have to read this whole book. I can just come to the chapter on goods and services and turn to page six, and that is all the information around goods and services. And if you remember, because we're talking about economics and our essential question again this week is how do goods, um, how do the goods we make, buy and sell connect us? We talked about goods and services. Miss Anna um, had us look at that last week around goods and services. So just as a refresher, because we're going to be talking about something that has to do with goods and services in just a minute, um, that a good is something, are things that we eat, wear, or use. So a good is something that you can touch with your hand. Now a service are where it is work that are done for people by others, or wait, yeah, for others. So selling something, 
Teachers provide a service, doctors provide services. See if you can think of some of the other people in our lives that provide services. So that's how we use a table of contents. Now there was something at the end of a book, there were two things at the end of an informational text that help us. Does anybody remember that? See if you can remember it and tell somebody in your house right now what one of those two things are, if you can remember. If you remembered that one of them was called the glossary, then good for you. You remember that in the glossary is the definitions of the words that the authors think are the most important for your understanding of the material within that book. So in this glossary, we have words like allowance, and that was a word that we covered last week. That is money that you earn for doing tasks for your family. We read a whole book about a little girl who earned a buck a week for doing different chores around her house. We have things like earn, which is to get money for the work that you've done. And then of course we have the definition of goods. And then down here we have the definition of services as well if you needed to just find the definition. So you can go to the glossary and that can also help you understand the concepts or the information you need from an informational text. The second thing you find in the back of an informational text is the index. And the index is super important. And I use the index all the time when I have to do research for my job because sometimes I don't have time to read through everything within a book to pick out just the information that I need. But if I know I'm specifically wanting information around a topic, I can turn to the back of that informational text and I can look and see where in the book that topic is covered. So if I wanted to know about income, which was one of the words that we talked about last week, I know that that is covered on page five and six, but it's also covered on page 18. So that is where an index comes in extremely valuable because that way we can just target the information we need, go to that page, read about that information, take our notes, and then we have that information and then we can go and look at other books around the information we need instead of having to read every single thing. Now, sometimes, however, it is great to read a book from cover to cover because you might learn something that you didn't know that you needed to understand the concept you were doing. Or it can also give you an idea in a way that you wouldn't have had that idea before if you hadn't read about it in the book. So sometimes it's good to read it all the way through, but sometimes we just need to find the information we need to find. Okay, so we left off last week talking about um, right before we started talking about making choices with our money. So we're going to learn about how we can start making some very good informed choices about how we spend that income or that earned money that we get from doing different tasks. So our book says, and this is the next chapter, making choices. Each family chooses how to use its income. First, a family spends money on goods and services it needs. Food is a good that we need. So it is important for us to start thinking about what are the things that we really need to be okay, right? And I think right now with what's going on in our country with the coronavirus and how we're having to stay home, we are having to think about what are the things that are essential? That's another big word. What are the things that are most important that we need to have done? And what are things that maybe we can wait on to have done? So it's important that we think about what goods and services we need to spend our money on. And it, right here it says, this woman is making a budget. A budget helps families to figure out how to use their income. Over here, Care from a doctor is a service we need. It 
Is there any money left after the family pays for what it needs? If so, the family might decide to donate their money. That means they give money to someone, oops, someone else who needs it. And I bet most of you have had an opportunity within your schools to do service projects and to make donations to families and other communities that might need our help. Another thing you can do is the family might choose to save some money. You can save money in a piggy bank or a jar. A bank is another place to save your money. And if you think back to last week when we read our story about our friend who earned her buck, she remember she learned that instead of spending her money, the buck that she earned that week, that if she went home and saved it and added it to the next week's allowance, that she could buy better things. So sometimes we learn to save our leftover money so that we can do other things with it. We can buy something that we want, like a new skateboard, or maybe if it's me, I save my money so I can travel because I love to go all over the world. So it's important to learn how to save our money and not spend it all right when we get it. Spending money. A family could decide to spend their extra money on something you want. A ski trip is a want. A kitchen table is a want. They may have to choose between the vacation and the kitchen table. And right here it says this family is buying a new bed. We see things to buy almost everywhere. We can buy toys, an apple, or a ride on a roller coaster. How do we decide? So this brings up an important concept between needs and wants. And what is a need versus what is a want? And I thought of a way that we could um, illustrate this or think about this with today. Today, I'm sure you've noticed that we've all been wearing hats and everybody's been wearing a different type of hat. Today is crazy hat day on At Home with APS. So this is my crazy hat and it is a hat that I wanted. It is not a hat that I needed. It's not a practical hat. It's not something that I'm going to wear when I go outside to do work. So it's my want. I wanted this hat. But I also brought a hat that is a need. So this is the hat that I need. This is the hat that I wear when I go outside because I wanna protect my skin from the sun. And this hat happens to have a feature where it blocks almost 99% of all the UV rays, which are the ones that um, damage our skin. So I wear this hat when I go out and I garden or I go hiking or I even go to the grocery store. So this is really a need for me. It was very important that I spend my money to buy this to protect myself. So this hat is my hat that I need, but this lovely hat was actually I made for my oldest daughter when she was in elementary school for her crazy hat day. Um, so this was a want hat, right? It's a lovely hat. So this, this was my want but this hat is the hat that I need to stay safe. So that's a way to think about things, needs versus wants. If it's something that is going to make you safe, something that helps you to survive, like we have to buy food, that is a need, then that's important to make sure that we focus our spending there first. And then if we have money left over and we save it, then we can think about what we want to do with that money and we can get some of our wants. And it might be a fun hat. All right, so let's see what we have here. So the next page says, think carefully about your choices. Is there something you'd like to buy? Is it worth spending money on? 
or should you save your money? So this young lady would like to buy this giraffe or would you save to buy a different toy? So that's her want is that giraffe, but maybe you have a different want. If you save, you might be able to buy something better later on. You can make a list of what you'd like. And that is a wonderful strategy, is to think of all the things that you would like to have and how much they cost. And then you can think about how are different ways you can earn the money for that. Some kids get an allowance. And remember, we've talked about an allowance before. And I'm wondering, do you get an allowance? And if you don't, is that something that you could talk to the grown-ups in your house that you would be willing to provide a service or make some goods to earn that allowance? And then with that money, what would you do? It says right here, an allowance is money that adults and some families regularly give to kids. And I said this last week, I, growing up, I got an allowance, but it was not given to me. I had to do things for it. I had chores and both my daughters, they got an allowance as well when they were growing up, but they had a list of chores that they had to do and they had to do them without me asking them or reminding them to do them if they wanted their allowance. So they did get an allowance, but they had to make sure that they did those chores. Or maybe you earn wages, remember that's the money you work earn for working, um, doing chores for a neighbor, and what will you do with your money? So think about what are some of the things that you at your age could do as a service to someone else that they might be willing to pay you for? Like maybe pull weeds for your neighbor, I really could use a nice uh, weed puller. So, you know, if somebody wants a job, they can look me up and come tell me they'll pull my weeds. I might pay you a wage for it. Um, dog walkers. And when you get older, babysitters. So here's an activity you could do around needs and wants. You could look at the pictures here, or you could look at different pictures and find some at home. Which ones are needs? Which ones are wants? Write your answer on a separate piece of paper. And I would change this activity just a little bit. And at home, maybe you could ask somebody in your house to help you cut out different pictures out of magazines or draw them. And then you could think about what is a need and what is a want. And you could do a sorting game. And that would be really fun. And then maybe you could try to make it tricky and do it for another family member and see if they could identify needs versus wants. Well, it has been a wonderful afternoon here with you guys looking at money and how to earn it and spend it and save it. So thank you for joining us again for our second third grade hour of At Home with APS. See you on Wednesday.